If you're a real estate agent earning $200,000 a year and you want to grow your passive income, this show is for you. Learn secrets other agents use and hear from experts in our field who will guide you on your journey to investing in assets like apartment communities so you can take your commissions and turn them into cash flow. Here's your host, Randall. Let's dive in. All right, welcome back. It has been uh, a long road. I'm getting a ton of emails coming out, and they are all about the NAR settlement. I've got people reaching out to me, and I've got not only San Antonio Board of Realtors, the other board that I'm a member of, the National Association of Realtors are all sending messages out. I've got all kinds of investors and clients and everybody reaching out wondering what is going on and what the implications of the National Association of Realtors settlement are going to be. Today, we're going to cover the National Association of Realtor lawsuit and the settlement that they have now agreed to, but it it has to be approved by the court. And so I keep getting a ton of info. And like I said, just a second ago, I'm getting getting all these emails and people are wondering what's going on. Let me break it down. I literally was just watching videos on what the NAR president put out. His name is Kevin Sears and uh, what the chief legal officer there was, what is her name? Katie Johnson putting out about the settlement. So just high level, what has happened National Associates of Realtors had three options, and they picked the path that was the the least worst option. They were all bad. They could have either appealed, and they would have had to put up a, about a $5 billion bond that was a potential maximum penalty that they could have been handed down because it was three times the original, and the original case said something of $1.8 billion. So they were looking at a $5.3 billion potential claim. And so in order to appeal that, they would have had to put up a bond in order to cover that. There was there they didn't have the assets available to do that. And so that was option one off the table. Second option was if they went to appeal, so they could post the bond and they went on appeal, uh, it still would have left all the additional associations around the country open to litigation, right? The third option, which was working out a settlement, would be one to settle with NAR, but also to settle all of the copycat cases that have popped up around the country for all the individual MLSs and other brokerages and that sort of thing. And so they have chosen to do the third option, which is settle. And the settlement is for $418 million over a four-year period. So let's break down exactly what happened. So they secured a broad release of liability for all MLSs and brokers of $2 billion or below. So if you're an individual broker or a brokerage of $2 billion or below, then you should be covered. It does not release any anything in any of the agents who were with Home Services of America. They were also named defendant in the case or any other defendants who were separately listed in the case. Okay, so it is... They settled for $418 million over four years rather than a potential $5 billion claim against them. Second thing that happened was that they are agreeing that we are no longer able to advertise buyer compensation on MLSs. So let's break down what that actually means. So we're currently on an MLS or prior to this, I think it's they're going to enact these changes in July is what they said. But prior to this, you would go on the MLS, you would look at uh, all the listings of commercial and residential, it didn't really matter, land, anything, and it would say the buyer's compensation on there. So 3% is being offered from the sell side to cover your buyer coming into that deal. So as an agent, you could go in, you could see that and say, oh, nice. And then you may have another one that says 2.5% or one that says 1% or one that says no. And what the whole crux of that lawsuit was, that would steer people, steer buyers, reps, representatives into the 3% commission deals. And I don't disagree with that. But again, like I said on a prior podcast, it's never been the case where you can't go and get your compensation from a from the buy side as well. It's just, so let me dive into that in just a second, my actual take on this whole deal in just a second. But so you can no longer actually advertise that on the MLS. So the MLSs are all going to, every one of them is going to cut this out. It's just going to be a, whatever the negotiated price is. However, in the statement from NAR, they state a few easy loopholes that you could immediately get around this, right? And they say that you can talk about it offline. So either a phone call, which again, all right, I'll get into that in a second. The last thing that, that the settlement states is that you must have a written buyer rep agreement going forward. So that document's always been in place and and available from all the associations. And like the Texas Association has one, 
Texas Association of Realtors, and it's a promulgated form. You could use it, and you should have been using it this whole time anyway, because then it guarantees your compensation if the sell side doesn't pay you, right? And then it's a, an agreement between you and the buyer how much you're actually working for. If you don't have that and the sale side decides not to pay you, then you end up not getting paid. You've done all this work, you know, get paid. And if you can't justify that with your buyer, um, that you should get paid for driving them around, showing them 20 houses or for orchestrating a, a lease on their behalf for a commercial building or whatever you are doing in order to earn your commission, then you probably shouldn't get paid anyway. But the value is there that you're providing. And if you can't sell that to them, then that's, again, you should always be using these things. Again, let me go down and break down this second part and why I think it's somewhat silly. Because if you're able to simply go on now and you can talk to an, an agent and say, hey, how much are you, are you paying me on this sales side? they'll tell you. So now it's just going to be a quick phone call, which is causing a little bit more friction in the transaction process, which makes very little sense, but it's still going to happen. So essentially the biggest thing that the lawsuit was about was advertising these, the compensation and the sellers ultimately being responsible for paying the buyer's fee and feeling that they overpaid or yeah, were charged too much to sell their properties, right? What essentially I feel like is going to happen is there's going to be this secondary market somehow. It's going to be a mechanism where the seller or seller's agent is simply relaying to the buyer's agent how much compensation they're going to get. That's one thing. I don't know. I, I don't know. Maybe sellers now are going to be only arguing for 3% or maybe less or I don't know. So I'm not sure how it's going to work out on that front. But I, I do know that things are getting sh going to be shaken up just a bit. But if it turns into a deal where the seller, because here's an, here's the crazy thing, the, what is her name again? Katie Johnson from NAR, chief legal officer. She says, I want to be clear that all this means is that you cannot advertise that rate on MLS. You can, and you can go to the video. I'll, I'll click a link. I'll share a link to the video in, in the show notes of her actually saying this. You can, however, still have the seller offer to pay all the buyer's closing costs. If now the commission is going to be paid by the seller or the seller's agent or the list agent, and on the residential side, you're going to have a buyer rep coming in and still wanting to get paid and the buyer has agreed to pay them 3%. Okay. What happens if the seller now has to pay or offers to pay buyer's closing costs equal to 3%? It's shenanigans of a different name. So if that is what happens and that's the trend and now you just see a bunch of 3% closing cost credit being paid by the seller to the buyer at closing, it's the exact same thing happening. It's just a different line item. And NAR is not shy about sharing it. It's on this website. Again, if that's what happens, yeah, I don't understand what this litigation would have solved other than just making a lot of attorneys some money. Uh, anyway, that that's what I see on on that front, and that's what's actually happened with the settlement. Uh, it has to be approved by the court, so it's not finalized yet, but I think both sides have agreed, and they've submitted it to the court for approval. I, I don't see what would stop that. Maybe we'll find out soon enough. Okay, so that's what's going on on the local brokerage side. If this settlement goes through, then it shouldn't be a thing any longer other than the changes that have to be enacted. Okay, so that's the latest that uh, we've heard on the National NAR settlement. Uh, and so if you have any questions or you want to talk about it, feel free to reach out to me, emails podcast at agents about the cash flow. Happy to chat about it and get your feedback on what you think is going to happen and the possibilities for brokerage going forward. You guys have a great rest of your day and we'll see you on the next episode. Did you know that 80% of the agents we speak with got into real estate in order to gain passive income so they could obtain financial freedom and become work optional? If you want to stay up to date, the best way is to make sure you're subscribed. So if you haven't done that, go ahead and do it now. We'll catch you on the next episode.